<laughs> so I wanted to return to, to one of the things you talked about, which is DNA repair. Um, mm-hmm. So you, you did talk, you had a paper where you showed that calorie restrict, short-term calorie restriction in mice. So it, although we've already talked about why mice may not be the same, but anyway, the, the short-term um, enhanced, induced DNA repair, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I just wondered if we could extrapolate from that. So would fasting, I mean, how long was the calorie restriction? And, and would, so would that imply that fasting would, be, would have the same effect in humans? Yeah, no, that was an interesting study. Uh, in that case, we only kept them for, you know, like a month or two. Uh, and then we could already see this effect. Uh, and then those mice that were restricted for a longer time, the effect was sort of diminishing. Mm. Uh, so what we didn't really uh, do a lot of different types of dietary interventions. Uh, but what to me, what it said, what that result suggests is that maybe for humans, uh, most optimal strategy is not continuous calorie restriction, but something that's called intermittent fasting. Uh, where you you know may you know skip lunch for example or fast one day a week so that may be much more manageable for people than continuously restricting themselves and that may be actually even more beneficial because what it does it provides certain stress to the body but the, the stress is not harmful it, it just upregulates our repair capacity and then you know the rest of the week people eat normally and then again you kind of stress your system very very gently um, Mm. that upregulates repair Uh, so I think uh, there is really a a good um, you know that's very promising strategy intermittent fasting even you know another popular approach is um, just to try to limit um, the time of day uh, when you eat, so for example, only eat when it's light outside and not to eat late at night. So you have at least 12 hours mm. <laughs> of night time that you don't eat. And just that by itself may be very beneficial already. Like we don't know, you know, in terms of human lifespan, but in terms of just the metabolic disease, there is clear benefit. Right. So do you think it's... Um... If you're going to skip one meal, is skipping breakfast or is skipping dinner better? Or well, you know, there are, you can find all sorts of recommendations of what you should skip, and uh, there is actually very little scientific ground for either of them. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that that's actually <laughs> that's the truth of uh, those dietary recommendations because yeah, there are, there haven't been rigorous enough studies to support one strategy over the other. Mm. Um, I think that, yeah, not eating late at night, there is a quite, you know, a lot of evidence uh, that that's a good idea uh, because when people eat very late, uh, so it's really, you know, connected to elevated blood sugar and all those metabolic factors. Mm. Um, also may disrupt circadian rhythm. So there were several very nice studies published in mice and mice are nocturnal. So they are like the other way around. They, they eat at night and they should not eat during the day. Uh, so there it seems like with mice, if you force them to eat during the day, so that's actually bad for them. So that shortens their lifespan. So for mice, it was beneficial to restrict their feeding to the night hours when normally mouse would eat. Um, now, you know, back to your question, what's best for human? I think everyone should just do what works for them because there is no strong uh, evidence on hum- based on human studies of what's best. Um, many people tend not to eat breakfast just because you know that's <laughs> that's what uh, they're used to doing. Then there are also dietary recommendation from dietitians to actually eat breakfast. So this is one meal a day that you know if you eat bigger breakfast, it doesn't result in weight gain as much as eating big dinners. So yeah, there are very conflicting 
recommendations. I personally, I like to eat good breakfast and then I skip lunch very often just because that's when I work mm. and it's easy for me to skip lunch and I'm trying to eat dinner not too late right. uh, so that there is still some time, you know, before I go to bed. Or... <laughs> yes. No, I... And actually, it's very helpful. If you skipped your lunch, you, you are very motivated not to have late dinner. <laughs> yes, no, that's true. Yeah, it, it is easier to have an early dinner. <laughs> so I have one other question. So you had a paper on bats. So, so you said bats live longer, and part of this is immune system. But they yes. seem to have much more effective autophagy than, mm-hmm. is, than, um, than, I guess, other animals. So is this autophagy, uh, is that part of the immune system? And would that, again, is that translatable to humans? Would, would increasing our own autophagy help us? Yeah, so autophagy is one of the mechanisms that enhanced in bats. Uh, they have other very interesting you know, mechanisms that are enhanced. So it's, it, I don't think it is just autophagy, which is like other factors with aging. It's for every long-lived species, it's not a single process. There are multiple, mm. but probably the re- the reason bats uh, enhance their autophagy is one uh, to fight viruses because autophagy is like a recycling system within the cell, and it can also gather mm. viruses and recycle them. Uh, but more generally, autophagy recycles all different damaged components of the cell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and bats, they can fly. And when they fly, they're very metabolically active. So there may be some damage happening inside the cell because of just high metabolic activity. And so they need good autophagy to clean up mm. uh, very efficiently. Um, so yeah, the strategy of looking for activators of autophagy, there are people working on it i think that that's quite promising um so that may be you know another strategy to extend lifespan right a few minutes what, what i'd like to do is to talk talk about um so one is w- kind of your longevity protocol if you'd be willing to share that so, although we, we kind of talked about your eating schedule um yeah but so do you have any anything else that you do for you know, promoting your health and longevity yeah, I think the safest uh, strategy is, yeah, of course, not to overeat. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, maybe skip meal a day or just, you know, if you feel hunger occasionally, it's a good thing. And that's right. probably what we aim for with all kinds of dietary restrictions so that our body sometimes feels that, yeah, we're hungry. Uh, mm. That's a good thing. Um, moderate exercise. Um, and, I, and I would stress that it has to be moderate because uh, that very vigorous exercise like a professional athlete, that, that's definitely harmful on the body. Mm. Uh, but we need to stay active. So like walking <laughs> is a very good strategy of doing that. Mm. <laughs> I'm trying to eat a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, Mm. fewer grains because you know there are many of those standard dietary recommendations where people are told all oh, like grains are sort of the bottom of your food pyramid this is completely wrong if you look at the diets that are linked to longevity like mediterranean diet uh, people don't eat a lot of grains it's mostly vegetables mm. yes uh, okay. so okay. that's my strategy just fruits and vegetables um not a lot of red meat <laughs> but you know red meat it's maybe good for young people it's just it's after a certain age you don't feel like eating it anyways. <laughs> yeah yes um so do you can I ask you do you take any supplements well not on a regular basis no, no, no. I, i'm trying to eat again like berries uh, mm. there are spices uh, that are good. So I, I don't use salt in my cooking. I just would use spices. <laughs> right. Excellent. So can you tell us, so what is your lab working on right now? Can I, what's your most exciting project? Well, you know, we are very broad. There are so mm-hmm. many long-lived animals. So there are people, students and postdocs studying naked mole rats, uh, bats. So I have now two people working full time on bats. 
Uh, I have also two people working on bowhead whale, which is the longest lived mammal. So we look for mechanisms, you know, both uh, longevity and cancer resistance, because it is so big, it's surprising how it doesn't get cancer in this huge body. Mm. Um, and in terms of, you know, molecular directions, I'm very fascinated by epigenetics. So we work a lot uh, on mechanisms of SIR2 and 6 function in the cell and how it interacts with other enzymes that are responsible for packaging our DNA properly. And we are looking how whether SIR6 can rejuvenate the cell. And because it's not only we want to slow down aging, but ideally we would like to be able to use some interventions that could rejuvenate the cell uh, through epigenetic change. So that's something we are very excited about. Right. So, but in a more natural way than like trying to use Yamanaka factors, which also kind of regenerates the cell. But Yeah, so Yamanaka factors, this is um, in a very fascinating direction. Um, you know, I think there the safety concern is the, you know, mm. the biggest issue, because if you um, they differentiate the cell. Uh, it may arrive, yeah, you can get a young cell or you could get a tumor. <laughs> yeah. So this is a very big concern because a cell that's completely lost uh, its identity becomes a tumor cell. So we are looking for ways to kind of, you know, achieve epigenetic rejuvenation, but without changing cell identity. Uh, and we are testing different ways of doing it. It may be in combination of with Yamanaka factors or independent of Yamanaka factors. Interesting. Yeah, that that, that would be really interesting. Um, so, thank you. Can you tell? I, I just had a thought. Um, so, so, you have people studying bats. So, so you, you have bats in your. I mean, so naked mole rats. I can see like running around in in, in that plastic, um, the, the plastic underground thing that you made for them. But how do you study bats or bowhead whales? I mean, that, that sounds very oh, hard. We, yeah, we don't keep whales in, in our <laughs> aquarium, obviously. Uh, bats we could keep. So this is something we are considering right now. We don't have bats, but we got bat tissues from our collaborators who keep them. And so far, we were mostly doing molecular biology work where we didn't need to have bats. Mm. Um, but if we you know, if our experiments will arrive to the point where we want to test something on the whole animal, yeah, we can bring bats in. Uh, but with whales, yeah, we only, we work with cell cultures. My right. students um, travel to Alaska where they got, you know, samples <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, we use those cells. Okay, uh, that sounds interesting, getting samples from bowhead whales. But then... Dr. Gorbanova, thank you so much for, for your time today. And I do hope that we uh, get an opportunity to talk again. Well, you are very welcome. And yeah, I hope to talk to you again. Okay, okay. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Bye. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.